please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. And before even starting, let me thank you, the organizers of the ESI program, as well as the organizer of this workshop. It's a great opportunity to be back in Vienna, and I'm very glad to be here today. So this is the outline of my talk that is split in four parts, and I will start introducing some examples for time harmonic wave problems, starting to underline what are the numerical challenges that we have to face. Then I will introduce model order reduction methods for such PD problems where the parameter is the wave number. And I will compare standard or static model order reduction methods with spatially adaptive model order reduction method. And then the core of the presentation will be part three, where I will introduce three different types of spatially adaptive model order, model order reduction methods that all deliver a rational surrogate. And I will conclude presenting some numerical results. Okay. So let's start. I don't really have to, in, to, um, to introduce or spend too many words on the PD we are dealing with, due to the audience anyway. Uh, the target is the Helmholtz equation, that is the time independent form of the wave equation. And there are many different physical phenomena that are described by such a PD. One first example are transmission reflection problems. So this specific example has been introduced in this publication um, of 2015 and has been further studied in 2020. And the domain is a square and is split into parts, modeling two fluids of different refractive indices. And we assume to have an uh, incoming plane wave traveling along the direction D that is characterized by the wave number K and the angle theta. And what happens is depending on the angle theta, the plane wave might be reflected or refracted. And for this specific value of theta equal 29, the wave is completely reflected. But the difference is when you change the wave number, of course, as the wave number increases, then the analytical solution gets more oscillating. And this reflects onto the fact that when you want to uh, discretize such an analytical solution, you need to employ finer meshes as the wave number increases. No surprise. Then a second uh, family of problems that are modeled by the, um, the Helmholtz equation are scattering problems. So these specific examples come from this publication in 2019. And the scatterer is the section of a plane wing with open flat. Again, we have an incoming plane wave. And the problem here is connected with the open flat shock, uh, slot that may cause resonance type behaviors. And what I mean is what you see in the picture here. So you see that here the scattered wave presents peaks that are four to five times larger than those of the incoming wave. And this is a phenomenon that from a mathematical point of view, it is interesting to study, but from an engineering point of view, it is important to avoid. And the third family of problems are interior problems. So in this recent publication, 2021, we are considering the domain, which is a rectangular domain with a hole. And what happens is, depending on the value of the wave number, the analytical solution presents local features that depend on the shape of the domain as well as on K. So this is reflected also in the um, finite element grid, where we compute the solution, because it is more refined where the analytical solution varies the most. So, I hope I convinced you that it's not easy to numerically solve the Helmholtz equation, even though you probably are well aware of it. And uh, the analytical solution presents local features that depend on the shape 
of the domain as well as on the value of the wave number. So we want a model order reduction method for such a type of PD where the parameter is the wave number. So we want a strategy that is able to deliver a good approximation for the Helmholtz equation, no matter what the wave number is. Yes, please. So you assume the coefficients are constant? Uh, yes. Like here is just minus Laplace, and the only parameter is k. Uh, in your first example, you had a transmission problem. So. Yes, but they are numbers again. You mean the reflective indices, they are numbers and they are fixed a priori. They are not varying. Uh, this equation does not describe that. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Yes, you need to split and you need to split here. Yes, 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 yes. yes. That's all right. That's all right. It's not going to be precise. Yes, thank you. Okay, so um, I was saying, so the PD we are considering is a parametric Helmholtz equation where the parameter is the wave number. And it is naturally associated to the parametric PD, the so called solution map or frequency response map, as that associates which we number the corresponding solution to the PD. Then it is obvious that depending on the value of the input parameter, you get a different Helmholtz PE that has a different wave type solution. And what standard numerical techniques do is to perform the job or mimic the job performed by the second orange around. Instead, we are looking for a numerical technique that is able to mimic the job performed by the purple around. And one possible way to do that is by means of the so-called brute force approach. And this means that you choose your favorite numerical scheme, which for this talk will be the finite element method, and you apply it to all the PDs that you get corresponding to all the different values of the wave number you are interested in. Okay, that's very easy to be implemented and it is also very easy conceptually, but there is a huge drawback and uh, it is that it entails a computational effort that is typically unaffordable because already the solution of one instance of the Helmholtz equation is computationally expensive. And then imagine that you need to repeat the same type of computations hundreds or thousands of times. So this is out of reach. So how can we do better? And model order reduction methods are there to help us. Very, very briefly, what are model order reduction methods? in a nutshell. So they are two phases methods. There is the offline phase followed by the online phase. And during the offline, we perform two operations. We perform the sampling and then we assemble the survey. Sampling means that we evaluate the solution map S at few points. And this corresponds to the solution of a set of uh, finite element problems con that correspond to a set of values of the parameter k. And the output of this first operation is then a set of finite element solutions that is, are called snapshots. And then based on the computed snapshots, we assemble the survey. And this will be denoted with the tilde, and this is a good approximant to the solution map S. And we want it to be reliable and cheap to be evaluated. Well, typically those two operations are computationally expensive and it takes a while to get the approximant at S tilde in your hands. But the good news is you have just to perform those operations once and you are done. You can store the results and then you can use the results during the online phase, where whenever somebody else gives you a new parameter value k star that does not coincide with the set of parameter values that you have considered during the offline phase, 
then instead of spending your time again solving the Helmholtz equation for k star, you can simply evaluate the surrogate at k star. And what are possible applications? Well, first of all, multi query context where you need or where you want uh, to know the solution of the same PD, but for many different values of the parameter. And then real time responses where you need a response, like I said, in real time. Or since we are in this workshop, uncertainty quantification, where you can employ the surrogate inside an uncertainty quantification sampling method, or again, optimization problem. The main challenge here is that we need to include the features of the PD inside the model order reduction method. So before I showed you examples where the analytical solution is more oscillating as our parameter increases and it presents local behavior and possibly resonance type behaviors. All of these behaviors need to be included in the model order reduction method. Okay, so standard model order reduction methods compute snapshots on one unique same grid. So this means that no matter what the value of the wave number K is, then you always consider one same refined mesh and all the snapshots belong to the same finite element space. Well, um, this, in this specific framework we are considering might represent a big drawback because the analytical solution presents local features. And when a wide range of frequencies are considered, then you need, or in order to get accuracy, you need to consider a uniformly refined mesh everywhere. And this possibly um, entails waste of computational effort. Instead, or in contrast, there are spatially adaptive model order reduction methods where each snapshot lives on a different adapted finite element space and is computed on a mesh that is adapted to the local features of the continued of the analytical solution at the corresponding wave number k. So here you have a picture of the different wave numbers and to different grids. Well, there is a big advantage of considering such type of specially adaptive or H adaptive more methods. And it is that each snapshot is adapted, uh, is computed on a finite element that is adapted to local features. So in some sense, we um, try to minimize the number of degrees of freedom that are required in order to get a fixed accuracy. This saves computational resources. But the problem is that this type of methodologies entail intrinsic difficulties. Like for example, you can think that even linear combination of snapshots cannot be easily computed. So how do we, do, how do we deal with that? One possible remedy is to um, uh, make all the snapshots live in the same common finite element space, which implicitly means that you need to compute the so-called global overlaid mesh, which is the smallest common refinement of all the adapted finite element meshes. Well, this is on the one hand a nightmare from a computational point of view and on the other hand it goes against the spirit of spatial adaptivity so we do not want to follow remedy one and instead in all the methods that i will present you today we will strive not to construct the global overlaid mesh rather to construct only overlays of pairs of meshes because we will only compute inner products or L2 scalar products between pairs of snapshots. Then adaptive 
Yes. Uh, could be, yeah, 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 could be. That's not a problem. We can deal with it. Page eight. Page eight is this one? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, that, that's just a simplistic way of writing the parametric Helmholtz equation, but you can totally have boundary conditions that depend on k. And if they depend on k and not on k squared, then you have to consider really k and not k squared as a parameter. So you will have a linear as well as a quadratic tendency of the PD. Yes. Assuming that the solution exists for all leaf number k in this interval, yeah? Uh, no, we allow ourselves to have um, cases where the solution, where k is really an eigenvalue. So if you allow real poles. Yes, oh. that's a trick, yes. That's actually the main focus, and we will realize it in a couple of times. Yes. So the K is, is having a few gaps, yeah, this interval. It has a few. It has I mean, you can show uh, that the solution map is regular everywhere except in the set of poles. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Boundary conditions are not uh, eliminating the real. No. No, 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 they are not. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Ah, yeah. I was saying, um, specially adaptive model order reduction methods for coercive parametric PDs have been subject of recent mathematical literature. For example, in this contribution, but Eilis Stein Urban in 2017. They have used an adaptive wavelet scheme to compute snapshots that serve as input to a greedy reduced basis method as model order reduction method. And um, Ullman, Rothschild, and Lang in 2016 have used adaptive finite element method coupled with POD. And Yano has used the always in 2016 adaptive finite element. Uh, method coupled with a greedy reduced basis method. And the novelty of our contribution stays in the design of specially adaptive more methods for non coercive and parametric elliptic. And if you remember, the two operations that we need to perform offline are the sampling and the surrogate transfer. So the choices that we make is we sample by means of the adaptive finite element method. And the surrogate is assembled in a, um, by means of a re model order reduction method that delivers a rational based surrogate in the sense or with the scope of including possible resonances uh, inside the model. Okay, and now we come to the core of the presentation. And I am first focusing on the computation of the snapshots by means of the adaptive finite elements. So we compute the snapshots that serve as input to the model order reduction method by means of a conforming piecewise affine finite element method on a simplicial mesh EH. And the adaptive procedure is guided by a residual based a posteriori error estimator, in particular the one proposed in 2017 by Bespalov, Haberland, Pretorius. So in the two lines here, you, you read the local refinement indicator that is composed of four pieces. You read the residual of the uh, PD. Here you read the jumps of the normal derivative at the interface of internal yes, elements. So for this boundary condition on gamma r, you eliminate real resonances. Yes, so this is the general structure and possibly we also deal with the case where gamma r is empty, meaning that this term is appears. Okay, so now term number three, uh, 
deals with the Neumann part, and term number four deals with the Mann part. And if you sum up all the local contributions, you get the a posteriori error estimator. And standard uh, computations can show that eta H is reliable and efficient in the sense that there exist two constants, C, rel, and CF, so the reliability and detectivity constants, so that eta H is an upper and lower bound of the error. Yes. Depending on K? They are, yes. And this term to, uh, takes into account the so called data also. Okay, and then the adaptive algorithm has the form solve, estimate, mark, and refine. So in the sense that we start solving by means of the finite element method on the grid TH, and then we compute all the local refinement indicators and the regions of the um, physical domain where the local refinement indicator takes large values are marked for further refinement. And the marking is performed by means of the Dörfler marking criterion introduced in 1996. And the refinement is uh, done performing the newest vertex by section introduced in 2013 by Karlukic, Pavlicek, and Petro. And this procedure uh, automatically delivers you a mesh that is adapted to the problem and to the wave number you are considering and gives you somehow a way to reduce the number of degrees of freedom you need to consider at a fixed accuracy. And the procedure stops when uh, the a posteriori estimator is smaller than a fixed tolerance or when the number of degrees of freedom of the underlying finite element space becomes larger than a fixed quantity and max. Okay, this concerns the sampling and then based on the snapshots that we have computed, we want to introduce a surrogate. And this slide is to convince you of the reason why we need a rational type of surrogate. Well, for interior problems, um, then it can be proved that the solution map is meromorphic in the sense that it is regular everywhere and it presents poles that are of order one and they correspond with the set of eigenvalues of the Laplace domain. And you can, yes? Why do you prove that the order is exactly one? Yes, it is exactly of order one for all eigenvalues, even for eigenvalues that have multiplicity larger than one. And you can prove it using the eigen expansion of the solution. This is the expression that you have where phi is the eigen um, basis of um, eigenfunctions of H1, that is H1. And from a graphical point of view, you can realize it uh, if you look at the picture, where you see in the x-axis the wave number k squared that varies in a given interval of interest. And the blue line is the H1 norm of uh, the solution map. So each um, call. Uh, so each peak, sorry, each peak corresponds to a pole of the solution map, which in turn is an eigenvalue of the Laplace problem. And this type of study has been presented in 2018 by myself, Fabio, and Ilaria, and has been uh, generalized to scattering problems in 2020 by also. Avide. The difference is that it is not available a characterization as precise as we have for interior problems in the sense that poles might not be over the one and in the sense that residuals might not be H1 orthogonal. But nevertheless, uh, it makes sense to introduce or to construct a rational approximant for 
the solution map S in both cases. And the roots of the denominator will give us approximations to the resonances of the problem. Okay, so I hope I convinced you that we need a rational surrogate. And now what type of construction do we employ? And I will present you three different type of constructions with advantages and disadvantages. Well, um, in, this, in the case where you know a priori the quantity of interest, so in the case where the functional F you are interested in is well known a priori, then an easy way to not have to deal with snapshots that live on different meshes is just to construct a rational approximant to the scalar output Y. So we construct a rational approximant Y tilde, which is the ratio of two polynomials, P and Q. Those two polynomials are polynomials in the complex plane, and they have degree M and N respectively. And one possible way of performing rational interpolation is by minimizing the linearized weighted interpolation error at the sample points Z. So ZJ is the set of sample points. We have capital S of them. WJ are weights and we minimize this quantity. And typically you need, or yes, you need a normalization constraint in order to avoid the trivial solution P equal Q equal zero. Possible choices are either you fix Q in zero equal to one, so it means that you fix one coefficient of the denominator. A second possibility is you fix the norm of the vector of coefficients to be equal to one. Typically, this is more numerically stable. And the key property of such standard rational interpolation method, so SRI, is that you need at least m plus n plus one snapshots for an approximation of order m, this is the numerator, and n, this is the denominator. And uh, of course, you can express the polynomials in any base that you are pleased to use but you are happy whenever you have a basis with good numerical properties. So in the case or in the particular case when the degree of the numerator coincide with the degree of the denominator, then a stable approximation can be obtained if you employ the so-called barycentric coordinates that are based on zeta support points. And keep in mind that you have N support points and you need at least capital S um, snapshots to compute the rational approximation. And when you do that, you have this guy, which is the nodal polynomial. And typically you weight the minimization problem that I showed you before using nodal uh, evaluations of the nodal polynomial. And if you use barycentric coordinates, then you can rewrite the minimization problem in a simpler way. So what you want is to minimize this guy and you have two different constraints. The first one is the same constraint that I showed you before. This is to avoid uh, the trivial solution. The second constraint gives you interpolation of um, the rational approximant at the support point. And in the drawback, what you have to compute is a um, matrix, capital G, a loner matrix, and you have to compute its singular value decomposition. So this lies in the data. Then this uh, type of techniques has been extended to the case of infinite dimensional targets. So for example, you want uh, a target V that is the restriction of the solution to a subset omega that potentially can even coincide with the entire physical domain. And this means 
that you need to look for a V tilde, that is the ratio of two polynomials. And we we'll look for the two polynomials in barycentric coordinates because they present good numerical properties. So you can extend uh, the lines that I showed you before to this case, but you have to take pay attention to two different things. The first one is the denominator here is or uh, remains a, a polynomial with values in the complex plane, whereas the numerator p is a polynomial with coefficients in the space capital D or calligraphic B. And the second difference is you have to replace the absolute value you were dealing with before with the V norm. And if you do that, you can compute the V tilde surrogate. And as you can see, again, we have the two same constraints as before. In the drawback, again, we have to compute a matrix, which is somehow a vectorized version of the previous one. And again, we have to compute its singular value decomposition. The difference is now that here you have a V norm, and this um, turns into the need of computing inner products, and in this case, L2 products of snapshots living on different meshes. Yeah, so this represents a um, computational challenge in the sense that you need to be able to deal with snapshots on different meshes, but uh, the advantage is that once you have the surrogate for the target, V, then you can a posteriori compute the surrogate for any functional of it, provided that the function has support in small omega. So a posteriori in the sense that you don't have to train any surrogate model again. You just evaluate the surrogate that you have. And like I mentioned before, possibly omega might coincide with the entire capital omega. This makes things on the one hand more complicated because you have to compute L2 inner products twin snapshots on different meshes and on the entire domain. But once you did that, you have a very powerful weapon because then you are free to derive surrogates for any um, uh, any linear function. Okay, third strategy is the multi-point rational interpolation or MRI method. And the target of this method is the solution U that is meromorphic as we have seen before. And the idea that stays behind this method is we want to improve the standard rational interpolation method by reducing the number of snapshots to get an approximation of a fixed order. And this technique has been introduced by Davide and Nobile and Fabio in 2020 and 2021. So he, uh, Davide will talk uh, more about this technique this afternoon, so I'm going to be brief on that. Um, the main ingredient is the interpolant operator I sigma on the set of sample points. And uh, again, we want to construct a rational approximant P over Q, whereas before Q is a polynomial with complex coefficients, whereas P is a polynomial with coefficients live in X, calligraphic X, which typically is H1 or H10, or depending on the boundary condition that you have. And again, we want to use barycentric coordinates. And the idea is you want to decouple the computation of the denominator from the computation of the numerator. And to compute the denominator, you again have to solve a constraint minimization problem. And the constraint is the same as before. And in the drawback, what you have to do is to compute a Gramian matrix where each entry is the inner product of two of pair of snapshots. And again, you have to perform the SP. So this, of course, is computationally expensive. And once you did that, you set the polynomial uh, numerator to be the interpolant of UH, so the snapshots times the denominator that you have previously computed. 
Okay, so the advantage of such a technique is that you can compute an approximation of order S minus one just using S snapshots. And this is in, constant with, in, in contrast with what you need for the SRI, which is two S minus one. So you get an approximation of the same order, but requiring basically one half of the snapshot. Okay, and now I will present a couple of numerical experiments with the aim of comparing the techniques that I presented. So the first example is a toy problem and we take omega to be the tetraangular due to symmetry of the problem. What we are looking at is basically the restriction to omega of the solution to the same problem, but on the screen. Okay, so we know exactly what the analytical solution of such a problem is. And this is the case where we have uh, poles, real poles. And first of all, we want to compute one snapshot by means of the adaptive finite element scheme. So for this purpose, we fix k squared to be 51. This is not a resonance of the problem but it is close to under. The closest one is 50. And the analytical solution is represented here, whereas um, on the bottom you have two finite element solutions after 50 and 143 iterations of the adaptive scheme. And at the top left, you see the behavior of the real error, which is the dashed blue line, and the indicator or the a posteriori estimator, which is the solid black line. So let's look at this picture as the mesh gets adaptively refined. If you look at this picture, you can basically split the picture into parts because you can identify two different behaviors. If you look at the left, you see that there are peaks. One in particular is shared by the exact error as well as by the a posteriori estimator and those peaks are due to the resonances of the discrete problem. So we know that this k squared is not a resonance of the continuous bar one, but it might be a resonance of the discrete one as the mesh gets refined. And instead, uh, I mean, and then if you stop the adaptive algorithm too soon, like here, you see that you get a very poor approximation. So this it has nothing to do with the exact analytical solution. And you have to stop the adaptive algorithm after all the peaks are performed in the sense that you have to stop the algorithm once you have reached the convergence uh, area. Yes exactly the size of the domain it's like minus one one or zero one or uh, honestly i don't remember anymore but in the bottom we have shown some x2 is this from the domain yes okay so possibly it's a zero pi okay. yes. the asymptotic onset of Minus one half is exactly when the resonance has been resolved. Yeah. Yes. The, the distance to resonance is one over fifty. The resonance at fifty is fifty one. Yes. One over fifty, and then the number of degrees of freedom is two hundred fifty. Yes. It's exactly the number of degrees of freedom by spike. And then yes. Yes. Following the same. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the message here is it is really important for the accuracy that we stop the adaptive algorithm after all the peaks have been occurred. Say again, I'm sorry. What happens if k squared is 50 points? Oh, okay, that's a very interesting question. And what happens is, okay, if you take exactly the eigenvalue, uh, exactly the resonance, what happens is that the estimator grows, that grows infinitely. Instead, if you take something that is slightly different, then it will grow, and at some point it will start decreasing. Very late, yeah. 
it could be very late, yes. And that's a challenge. So that's this makes, of course, things difficult because it's not easy to decide what to do a priori when you uh, when you run the code because a priori you don't know where the resonances are. So it could be okay. Yes, and this is the reason why we have also fixed an N max. Okay, so at some point the algorithm has to stop. And if it's stopped because of n max, what we practically do right now is we let n max increase just one time again, like we double it once. And if again the indicator increases, then we just discard what we get. Well, okay, and let's look now at the approximation of a quantity of interest which is the integral of u and the interval of interest is one and 100. And we compute y tilde by means of the three techniques that I mentioned before. So standard rational interpolation directly on y, so directly on the output, multipoint rational interpolation and POD for the sake of comparison. And in the first line, you see the value of the quantity of interest for the three different methods compared with the analytical solution. And in the second figure, you see the relative error. So what we can observe, for example, is that the standard rational interpolation method uh, can identify, can better identify the position of the poles. And this is because we have more samples. And on the other end, they all deliver good approximation. And in the table, I summarize the run times. And what we can observe is that the standard rational interpolation method saves time because you don't have to compute the Gramian matrix, so no inner products between snapshots are needed. And overall, if you compare the timings of the three methods, you can say that as RI and MRI are about 20% cheaper than the POG. And then very, very briefly, the second example, this is the example that I mentioned from the very beginning, where we are observing uh, this, the displacement of a thin membrane when it's, when it's clamped at the bottom, uh, sorry, at the bot, at the top. And here we have a datum G, that is not a fine, and this prevents the straightforward application of the POD. So for this example, we use the L2 gamma 1 as RE, gamma 1 is the bottom, and the multipoint rational interpolation method. And again, you see uh, the quantity of interest and the relative error for two different level of approximations. So order 14 and order 23. And from a computational point of view, they are comparable, at least in the results. And what you can observe is in the run times, the multipoint rational interpolation is, takes longer. And the reason is because here, you have to compute inner products of snapshots on the entire domain, whereas when you do this second method, you have to compute inner products of targets. So restrict it just to gamma one, which is aligned and it is easier. Okay, and I will skip my very last example and I come to my conclusion. So we have presented several rational based specially adaptive model order reduction methods for the parametric and frequency Helmholtz equation. And we have shown a couple of numerical experiments to compare the different numerical techniques. And right now we are working in extending the presented work in a way or in a greedy Z adaptive way. And I thank you for your